الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد So the title of this halaqa uh, for today and tomorrow inshallah will be about the topic of ghafla the topic of ghafla and let me start with a question what does the word ghafla mean ghafla what does it mean how can we translate the word ghafla into english any idea uh -huh. how i know Heedlessness. Heedlessness. Okay. Uh, in general, we're talking about, but you are applying it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, basically, that we forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Any, any other contributions? Ghafla. What does the word ghafla mean? Did you say sleeping? So, sleeping. Okay. Sleeping. What else? Like you're, you're doing something but you're not really thinking about what you're doing. Like, you know, you could be driving but you're, you're, your mind is somewhere else but you're still... So absent-minded, absent like absent-mindedness. Absent okay, absent-mindedness. Ignorance. Ignorance. Who doesn't agree with ignorance being ghafla? Forgetfulness. For forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. Okay. Good. What else? Okay. You know. Uh -huh. Speak up. Turn away from something. Well, that's a bit off the chart. But what I would say. You know, multiple choice exams. You have A, B, C, D. And then all the above, right? What's, the, what's that in Arabic? How was that in Arabic? Jami'a ma dhukir, right? <laughs> all of the above. So pretty much what you guys said falls under ghafla. Pretty much. Almost every, apart from turning away, that was a bit off. But the rest of it is actually falls under the concept of ghafla. Concept of ghafla. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Whoever had a dream in their life? Whoever had a dream, like when you're sleeping, whoever saw a dream? <laughs> Once? Okay. So now my question to you, who has a dream? Like, who's comfortable talking about that experience, having a dream? I'm not going to ask you about details, but just a general question. Okay, you had a dream. When you were in the dream, did you realize you were dreaming? It felt real, right? When you have a dream, it feels real. It feels real. Now, that's pretty much what the state of ghafla is. One of the scholars says, the most notable thing about ghafla is that when you are in it, you don't realize it. You don't, you don't realize you are in a state of ghafla. That's, that's why it's so tricky. It's so tricky. It's basically you're in a dream but you don't know it's a dream. If you know it's a dream, you're going to relax, right? Because it's not serious. But in a dream, you go through the experience. If it's something scary, you feel scared, right? If it's something painful, you actually feel the pain, right? Because you don't realize it's just a dream. The exact same thing happens when we are in a state of ghafla. We don't know that we're in a state of ghafla. We think we are awake. But we're actually in a slumber. We are in a slumber and this leads us to something very interesting you know one of the uh, one of the tabi'een says an-nasu ma damu ahya fahum fi subat humans when they are when they are in this life they're actually in sleep fa idha matu intabahu so when people die they wake up to reality so this life that we are in is actually more like being in a, is more like sleep 
And the ultimate reality, the ultimate consciousness and awakening is actually when we die. Because that's when we come face to face with the reality of everything. So in a sense, you can say we are in this life in a trance. We are in a trance. We're not really, we're not fully there, but we don't realize it. So we have different states of ghafla. So let's define ghafla. What is ghafla? Ghafla, yes, it can be translated as heedlessness. It can be translated as absent-mindedness. But it also entails forgetfulness. You forget. And it also feels like, what did you say? Okay, forgetting to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you basically, you, temp you temporarily forget about something. You forget about something. You know, does it happen to you like, let's say you're driving back from work, back home, and you had already made a plan that on my way back home, I'm going to stop by Walmart and buy the groceries, right? And you're, on, you're driving and your wife is waiting for the groceries because she wants to cook dinner. So you're driving and you're really, you're completely there, you're conscious, you're aware, and you ask yourself, did I forget anything? No. I'm pretty sure I haven't forgotten anything, right? And you're sure about this. So you go back home. The moment you hear your, your wife's voice, you wake up. Oh, I forgot about Walmart, right? It, it felt and it sounded so real just maybe 20 minutes ago when you were on the road that I didn't forget anything and I'm pretty sure. But now when you hear your wife's voice, you're not as sure. You're actually sure that you forgot something. What makes us forget something that is so evident and so clear? What makes us forget something that's so evident, so clear? Sometimes it's in front of our eyes, but we forget about it. That's a state of ghafla. So a state of ghafla, something is right in front of you, but you can't see it. It's screaming in your face, but you just can't see it. As simple as that. That's really what a state of ghafla is. So you have everything about it that you need in order to see it and hear it but you're not doing this that's really what a state of ghafla is that's why when you said ghafla is actually forgetting allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know the uh, the poet says wa fi kulli shay'in lahu ayatun tadullu ala annahu wahid and in everything in this universe everything you see there is a sign telling you about the unity of allah that allah is one Everything in this world is a sign, by the way. Everything. Whether it's an object like this uh, bottle, or it's a camera, or it's a human being, or it's an event. Everything and everything, there is a message tells you something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Ibn al-Qayyim has a beautiful, beautiful statement when he says, Allah is wise when he creates. So he says, when humans need something, Allah makes it available for them according to the level of the need they have so he says humans need food and they need clothes but their need for food is much more dire than their need for clothes right because you can still survive without clothes right but you can't survive for long without food and he says we also need drink we need water so he says, our need for water is much more than our need, or much more uh, urgent than our need for food, much more urgent than our need for clothing. And he says, if you contemplate and look around in the world, you'll find water more abundant than food, food more abundant than clothes, and so on and so forth. So he says, everything humans need, you're going to find it in proportion in existence. Then he says, the thing that humans need the most for their true survival, not only physical survival, but their true experience in this life is knowledge of Allah, love of Allah. That's what humans really need most, to live life properly and to make it to the next life. So he says, and this is the most available thing in the world, knowledge of Allah. He says everything in the creation, if you look at it with insight, it tells you something about Allah. So everything actually reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have everything screaming in our face, telling us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we fail to see it. We see the thing, but we don't see the message. 
and that's a state of ghafla and heedlessness, forgetfulness. You are more in a trance. Now, what really happens, some of the scholars say, you know, how does forgetfulness happen? And this will help us understand what ghafla really is. Why on the way back home, although like your wife probably told you a hundred times, I need onions, I need sugar, I need salt. Don't forget to bring that on the way back home. And like she made sure, and you probably put reminders on your phone, but somehow you just, as you were driving, you were driving, you were on autopilot and you forgot completely. You only remembered when you arrived home. So they say, how come you, you forget something that is so obvious? They say our mind goes according to levels. There are levels of awareness, levels of consciousness. When you tune into one level, sometimes you're separated from the other completely. You're separated from the other. How often like, and it happens by the way, mainly with men. It ha happens less often with women, happens with men. You say, for example, you come, I mean, if you're young, you go to your mom and you say, I can't find my glasses or I can't find my pen. I can't find my wallet. Like we married people, we go to wife, you know, where did you place my wallet? Where did you put it? I put it right here on the table. Are you sure? A hundred percent sure. I remember that. I can, I can even recall how I put it there. And you start searching for it, then she finds it in your pocket, right? This is a very common occurrence. So, so why am I so sure? It seems so real that I put my phone here, but when I actually didn't. When I'm the one who left it in my own pocket. So they say basically we travel between levels of awareness, levels of awakening. When you are at some level, you're completely separate from the other, you forget, you forget. And it sounds like you have no access to that. You have no access to that, to the other level. So you don't really recall at all. Even if you search for it, you can't even remember it. Now let me give you the biggest bombshell about ghafla. The biggest bombshell about ghafla. We humans have phases of our existence. And we have levels of consciousness, as weird as this sounds. We all have memories from our childhood that seem just like dreams. They seem just like dreams. They don't seem to be real. These are unique experiences we had when we were children. And you really, if someone were to tell you about this happened to me when I was a child, they would say that's, I mean, that's like a figment of imagination. It's not really real. But you know that you were there, it happened to you and it was real. But there are things that happened to you in your childhood that you completely forgot about. Probably your, your, maybe your parents tell you about that or an older person tell you about this. They said this and that happened. You had this experience and you were, and you were conscious and you were aware of it, but you don't recall it. You're completely separate from it. Why? That's what happens. We travel through time and sometimes we leave certain things behind at some level that we never go back to. Now I'm talking about our lifetime. Before we came into this world, we had an experience. Before, before we came into this world, we had an experience and Allah talks about it in the Quran. We, we were brought into existence before being born, by the way. Before your mother was pregnant with you, she was, you were actually, you were brought to life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ أَخْرَجَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ظُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ شَهِدْنَا أَن تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and Allah brought from the back of Adam all of his progeny. All of his progeny, all of us. All humans from the time of Adam till the time of the last man to ever live on earth. Allah brought them forth. And Allah addressed us directly. Am I not your Lord? Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Rabb? And all of us, each one of us said, Bala, yes indeed. Now you had this experience, I had this experience. Do you recall it? Do you recall it? You don't recall it, but it happened to you. But your, hearts know, your heart know it. Your heart knows it. Your heart knows it. And that's what we call intuition. And that's also what we call fitra. That's what we call fitra. You know, uh, 
if you're like myself, I used to ride bicycles a lot when I was young. I was always on my bike most of the time. But then for about a period of 25 years, I never rode a bike. 25 years, never rode a bike at all. And so last year I bought a bike because I had to buy bikes for my kids. I had to go with them. So I had to buy my own bike. So, and I said, I don't think, I didn't trust that I would be able to ride a bike. So when I was buying it from this lady, she says, give it a try. And I was really embarrassed. Am I going to just get on the bike and probably start falling right or left? But I got on the bike and I was just like when I was a kid. I'm riding perfect. Like as if I was just riding bicycle yesterday. I wasn't consciously aware that I had this skill. I forgot about it. But it was stored in my body. It was stored in my body. So I, I was in a state of ghafla about it. But the moment I was on the bike, it came back. It was stored in my body, in my system. So it was brought back. Again, our memory with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He brought us from the back of our father Adam. And then He addressed us directly face to face. Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? This was a real thing. It was a real thing. But in this life, we don't know it in our minds. But part of us knows it, and that's our heart. It knows it in the sense of intuition. Intuition. We feel it in our hearts. We might not be able to articulate it. We might not, we might not be able to describe it in words, but we know it in our hearts. And that's exactly what is meant by ghafla when the Muslim scholars use it. Literally. Ghafla from our real state. Ghafla from this great memory, which is basically the source of where we, the, our source of being, where we came from. So, so ghafla is not just, okay, I'm just busy with something, I forgot about this thing. You could live your whole life in ghafla, and you could, ghafla causes forgetfulness. You forget about these things completely. And if you, even if you search for them, you can't find them. And let me just give you this link, then I will move on to, uh, I'll just jump over to something else, something more practical about ghafla. Have you ever, and I'll just give you a personal example and you might be able to relate. Again, when I was young, I used to swim a lot. And at that time, it was in the 80s. So, uh, there was sunscreen, all sunscreen had one smell. There was one fragrance. All of the brands were just one fragrance. It was quite distinct. And all my memories about swimming when I was young are associated with that smell, with the fragrance. But since I was 10 years old, I, like I stopped swimming at that time. I didn't go to the, to, to, to the pool or anything. From age 10 to last year, Till last year and that's that's about 30 years <laughs> tells you how old I am so about 30 years I never came across this smell at all I never even remembered it I was completely heedless about it so I was on a trip to Montreal and when I was in the hotel I decided to go to they have a swimming pool so I decided to go for a dip I jump in the pool go back take a shower there and there was uh, a body wash some soap to wash yourself from the chlorine and the chemicals. And I get some of the soap on my hand and the smell kicks in. And all of a sudden, a lot of memories came to my mind that I haven't really rem haven't recovered in 30 years. Vivid memories, everything. I started seeing faces of people and everything. Why? Because of the association. So throughout these 30 years, I was in a state of ghafla of my experience of swimming previously but something brought it back to me and it awakened it was this the fragrance or the smell have you ever had a similar experience sometimes it's the weather a certain weather like rain like when I first arrived in Vancouver I started recovering memories from London from the UK is rainy cloudy all the time you don't get to see the Sun right so a lot of vivid memories came back. That's a state of awakening, which is the opposite of ghafla. 
the opposite of ghafla. So the opposite of ghafla, which is more like a slumber, more like a nap, more like a nap. Awaken, uh, I don't want to say awakening, because awakening is the English word. The Arabic word is yaqadha. And keep this word in mind, yaqadha. And to make it a bit more trendy, you can call it the Y state. Yaqadha starts with Y. So it's a y, y state. You get into a Y state or a Y factor. So we all have memories that when something, when we see something associated with this, with it, it sort of awakens us to those memories. Why? It gives us access to that world. It gives us access to that level of consciousness. Okay. Now, the state of ghafla we usually think it's in the mind we usually think it's in the mind i just forgot i just forgot but the state of ghafla has to do with our souls with this spirit has to do with the spirit then from the soul it controls the mind and that's why we forget that's why we forget and i will demonstrate this and clarify it inshallah as much as possible When humans die, and I'm going to go back to the quote that I started with, and here I'll start to make the bridge to the other point. Uh, that man from Atabi'in, he said, humans are in a state of sleep. When they die, they wake up. Why? Because the moment we die, we remember our meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our covenant with Him to worship Him alone before this life. We remember and we see it so clear. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah describes uh, the, the people when they die, people who disbelieved in Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, حتى إذا جاء أحدهم الموت قال رب يرجعون And when, when death comes to one of them, they say, oh Allah send me back. Straight away. Once you get into the state of death, you, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You remember you meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You remember it vividly and you, you're so aware of it that you can't go wrong about this. So what makes it hard for us to remember our meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our love of Allah, our longing to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What makes us forget all of this when we are in this life? What makes us forget all of this? So only when we die, we remember that. Actually, not one, only when we die, we can actually wake up before that death. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ was sent, by the way. This is why the Prophet ﷺ was sent. The Messenger ﷺ was sent to do two things. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Prophet ﷺ that Allah sent him for, to achieve two things. Tazkiyah and ilm. Tazkiyah and ilm. Allah says in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, Allah says in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته. He's the one who sent among the illiterates, who were the Arabs at the time, a messenger from amongst themselves. يتلو عليهم آياته. He conveys the message. He conveys the verses of Allah, the verses of the Quran. ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة. يزكيهم وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ يُزَكِّيهِمْ تَزْكِيَةً And number two, يُعَلِّمُهُمْ He teaches them the Qur'an and wisdom. This is what the Prophet is supposed to achieve. These two things, tazkiyah and ilm. Tazkiyah and ilm. Ilm, knowledge, is what? Learning. Like I tell you, for example, one of the conditions of wudu, one of the conditions of wudu is to say, Bismillah. You have to say Bismillah before you start your wudu. It's important. Okay? Bismillah, then you make your wudu. The Prophet says something. La wudu liman lam yusam ismallahi alayhi. There is no wudu for someone who doesn't mention the name of Allah on it. So you start your wudu with Bismillah. By the way, if you haven't been doing this, don't panic. Just do it from now on. Do it from now on, okay? Before you start your wudu, say Bismillah. If you happen to forget, it's okay, okay? Some scholars say it's one of the wajibat of wudu, not conditions. But anyway, let's say it's condition. It's a condition of your, for your wudu. Now, this is a piece of information. This is yu'allimuhum. This is he educates them. He teaches them. Give you a new piece of information. What is tazkiyah? 
What is tazkiyah? Usually we translate tazkiyah as purification. Well, it's close, but not close enough. Tazkiyah basically, in, in, in very wide terms, means awakening them. Means awakening them. Before you teach, you have to awaken. If the student is not awake, is not in a state of mind, like mindfulness and awareness and connection, they're not going to learn. They're not going to learn. And if they learn in their mind, they're not going to learn in their heart. So like someone knows smoking is bad for their health, but they still smoke, right? They know drinking is bad for their health, they still drink. They know driving, you know, dangerously could actually lead you to fatal incidents. But you still do that. You know it in your head, but you don't know it in your heart. That basically means you are in a state of ghafla. In a state of ghafla and heedlessness. And a state of absent-mindedness. So tazkiyah basically means to awaken them. Awaken what? Awaken what? What, are we, what is the Prophet supposed to awaken within us? Our fitrah. Our fitrah, which is in our hearts. He's supposed to awaken the fitrah in our hearts. What is the fitrah? Okay, let's go a little bit to basics. Make sure we're all on the same page. What is fitrah? What is fitrah? What does fitrah contain? It has a lot to do with the soul, yes. It's connected to the soul strongly. Fitra is what? Basic knowledge, about Allah. Basic knowledge about Allah. Only knowledge? So we know Allah. We are born and we know Allah. Our heart knows Allah. Did, you, did we read this in a book? No. We were born with this knowledge. It's already there. But you have to recover it. You have to recover it. You have to bring it to your awareness. Is it only knowledge about Allah? What does it contain? The desire to follow, love of Allah, longing to Allah. So not only knowledge, but also emotion and motivation. Wanting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You gravitate to Allah naturally as a human being. But you have to awaken that. That's what the Prophet says does. Tazkiyah, then ilm. So he awakens, and when you awaken, now you can teach. But if you teach before you awaken, you create robots. People who can read a book for you, people who can memorize a book for you, but it doesn't, it doesn't affect them, it doesn't change them, it doesn't improve them, it doesn't help them, it doesn't make them, doesn't make them better people. And that's why Ibrahim alayhi salam, now the Prophet says, Ana da'watu Abi Ibrahim. The Messenger says, I am the answer of the call of Ibrahim. What was the dua or the call of Ibrahim? In Surah Al Baqarah, Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Ibrahim turned to Allah when he was building the Kaaba. He said, Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasoolan minhum yatlu alayhim ayatik. Allah send a messenger from among them that he conveys your verses to them. Wa yu'allimuhum wa yuzakki. Yu'allimuhum al-kitaba wal-hikmah wa yuzakkihim. He teaches them the book and wisdom and then he makes tazkiyah for them. So Ibrahim alayhi salam put yu'allimuhum then yuzakkihim. Teach them then make tazkiyah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he responded, how did he respond? Reverse the order. Allah put tazkiyah, then ilm. Because you can't teach someone properly in a way that is beneficial without awakening them. Without awakening them. You have to awaken. And what do you awaken? You awaken their fitrah. You awaken their soul. When you awaken their soul, humans learn at a different level. They learn at a different level. And I remember there's, there's the story of this guy. He was born into a Muslim family. He wasn't practicing. He did everything wrong you could think of. And at age 21, he had an awakening. What was that awakening? One of his relatives passed away. When he saw the grave, he woke up to the reality of this life. He woke up and he said, one day I'll be in that grave. And it just created a mind shift in him. He changed completely. For the first time in his life, he picks up the Qur'an, the Mus'haf. First time in his life, at age 21, he picks up the Mus'haf and he starts reading in it. Three months later, he's memorized the whole Qur'an. Three months later, how come? Magic? No. He had a profound awakening. 
When you have a profound awakening, you can learn. You can learn. But when you are absent-minded, you don't learn. You don't learn. If I tell you, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna give you a set of instructions, okay? This is the set of instructions. Do this, do that, you know, or let me, let me say just now. Uh, do we have anyone who's never been on a plane at all? Never been on board? No one? No one? Like when I asked this question in Toronto, interestingly, you know, there are mo most of the younger ones, they've never been out of the city of Toronto. Never, never, ever. And they're like 25, 26 years old. <laughs> so it seems you guys are a bit more, mashallah, more open to the world. So let's say someone, you, I'm going to give you instructions as to how to, ride, uh, how to be on, on the board of a plane, right? So you, okay, you know, stay seated, you have to buckle up. And uh, if the, what is it, the alarm goes off, oxygen mask is going to go down, help yourself first, fit your mask first, then help someone else, uh, follow the arrows to the emergency exit, etc. I mean, that's, that's too boring, right? It's too boring. Let's just say an emergency really happens. As you're flying on the plane and it starts shaking and you have these like uh, air bumps and it goes uh, up and down, this turbulence. Then now, if someone tells you about the instructions, you're going to catch them like lightning, right? Why? Because you need them. Now you're awake. Now you're awake. Previously, in the first instance, you were in a state of ghafla. So that's the difference between ghafla and yaqadah, a wise state. So the Prophet ﷺ, before teaching humans, before teaching them, he had to do what? Tazkiyah. Awaken that fitrah in them and then give them the knowledge. Now what happens today when we teach people, students knowledge? What, what happens? We get the kid, memorize Quran. Memorize Quran, right? It's not a bad thing, but the problem is we stop there. Memorize, memorize, memorize. You'll find the kid memorizing Quran. Then, okay, memorize hadith. Learn this, learn that, learn this, learn that. And today there is, by the way, there's a phenomenon in the Arab world that is really scary. There is a phenomenon. There's a, there's a group of people, younger ones, who are between age 18 and 40. These people, you know, were bookworms. Literally, these people read a lot. They read a lot. And I would say they, they read thousands and thousands of books. They're really impressive. And I myself, a few years back, I came across some of these people and I was extremely impressed. Like they are very well read. They read fiqh. They understand it. They understand the madahab, the different madahab. They read aqidah. They read history. They, they read hadith. And they're quite impre impressive. They're encyclopedic. And it's difficult really to see, man, I mean, these are like scholars, but they're 25 years old, right? Give them time. Recently, it was a group of about roughly between 5 to 10 people. And they started writing books, publishing books. And their books are going like very popular, bestsellers. And they're writing about Islamic topics. Now, recently, these people split up. This group split up. And they started speaking against one another. And guess what? They're making videos on YouTube now and thousands are watching them and following them. Do you know what they say? I was with so-and-so. Do you know why I split with, with them? Because the other day we were in the restaurant, we were having dinner together. And we, he said, you know, you speak about this scholar. I don't like what you say. And I said, but you believe the same thing, but you don't confess it. It's childish matters. Really childish matters. And these people are taking the knowledge they have, the information they have, to such a low level, pathetic, really pathetic, that you say, I don't want to listen to these guys. I'm not going to take my knowledge from these guys. I'm not going to learn from these guys. Why? Because these people have the knowledge without the tizkiyah. They have knowledge without maturity, without an awakening. So what are they going to do with it? They're going to abuse it. If you see someone, for example, who's learning Islam and learning some stuff, and they go harsh on people, cutthroat approach, right? They go harsh on that's wrong, that's wrong, why you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. And they're judgmental against people. Just be sure these people are learning ilm without tazkiyah. 
without tazkiyah. So what? They're going to use it as something to serve their, their ego, to beat people down with it, without tazkiyah. So we, by the way, we are all in a state of ghafla. We are all in a state of ghafla. And really, I mean, for the younger ones, it might be difficult for you to understand what ghafla is because honestly, I mean, hopefully, inshallah, the time will come when you will realize what I'm talking about. But if you haven't been around in this life to see how things turn out to be and how things change over time and how things will smack you right in the face and wake you up, you don't know what really what ghafla means and what awakening from that ghafla really means. There are things that, like I remember myself, I had 100% belief and conviction about certain things when I was a teenager. And I said, these things must be true. Like rules about how to treat people and who deserves respect, who doesn't deserve respect. This person is going to be good, this person is going to be bad. I thought I was, I was very opinionated about this. I was very like completely like convinced about my opinion. And then later on, 10 years later, I realized how stupid I was at that time. It didn't seem like it at the time, but I realized I was in a state of ghafla. So we all humans, we go into the state of ghafla. And I said, the most dangerous thing about ghafla is that you don't know that you are there. Even when someone tells you, you can't see it. It is, how can I say, it is self-perpetuating. State of ghafla is self-perpetuating. It actually, it, how can I say, it does not allow you to see it. It will control your perception. It will control your perception. It will not allow you to see it. Now, uh, here I want to make my second point. Uh, oftentimes, when we start practicing Islam, when we become better Muslims, as I said, we jump right into learning, right? I want to learn. I want to memorize more. I want to learn more. I want to read this book. I want to read that book. And we think it's all about information. But information without this awakening, without getting out of ghafla, is not helpful. Actually, it could be detrimental. Imam ibn al-Qayyim, he wrote a book, and probably it's his masterpiece. It is called Madarij al-Salikin. Madarij al-Salikin. Fi manazil al-Sa'irin bayna darajati iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in. Basically, the book is about the stations, spiritual stations of the heart as you grow in your journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the most, like, I, I think my, in my personal opinion, the best book of Ibn al-Qayyim ever is probably one of the best books ever written on spirituality in Islam. Literally. Ibn al-Qayyim, when he speaks about, before he starts the journey of the stations of the heart, like love, like thankfulness, like uh, a shawq, yearning to Allah. Uh, like for example, something really interesting, like there's a, a station of the heart called al-bast, informality. It's a state of the heart where you actually get a connection to Allah where you feel the relationship is informal. Sounds a bit strange. But this is something the scholars actually had. Is when you open up to Allah like a very close friend. There's no formality. So, before he talks about these two things, or these, all of these things, he specifies four building blocks. He says, these are the beginning, the middle, and the end of all of your journey. If you get them right, you're going to get everything else right. If you mess out on them, you're going to have a whole messy journey. And what are these four things? And by the way, these four things are, are how humans grow, how humans develop. Number one, he says, the first... The first step on your journey to Allah is al yaqadha is waking up. So you have to get out of ghafla into yaqadha. If you don't get this, he says, you, you don't start on your journey. Even if you learn, you're still where you are. You stand still. You're not advancing in your journey. So the first thing he says, a state of yaqadha. Then he says, basically, you move from one I don't want to mistranslate him but he says basically you, tr you transcend from one level of existence to another level 
you move to another level of existence and he says you will start to see everything else in new lights I'll give you just an analogy it's not completely perfect but it illustrates and it's a very famous story there was this lady traveling and in the terminal at the airport she bought a pack of nuts as she was waiting for the gate to open she bought a, a pack of nuts then she takes this pack of nuts she finds a bench sits on the bench she fixes some of her luggage and she's eating from the pack of nuts right next to her she's eating from it as she's eating there's a guy sitting right next to her and she's shocked as the guy puts his hand in the pack of nuts and he takes some nuts and he eats and she looks at him like she's shocked like how disrespectful how dare you like extremely disrespectful right you just put your hand in my pack of nuts and you take nuts without even seeking permission so she takes nuts he takes nuts she munches on the nuts he's munching on the nuts and she's really she doesn't know what like she doesn't want to be rude she just keeps composure and she says let it go then finally there's there's one nut left so the guy puts his hand oh, and he, he, sorry, he, he carries the bag and he says, you take the last nut. <laughs> like she looks at him like she wants to punch him in the face. What are you doing? Like, how dare you even offer me my own nuts? Like as if you're doing me a favor. Now, she, she's really feeling bad about this, but she heads to her gates. On the way to the gate, she wants to make sure her passport is ready, the boarding pass is ready. So she uh, opens her bag and there's the pack of nuts. It's still in the bag. <laughs> it turned out the pack of nuts was actually the other guy's. It wasn't hers. Isn't that a moment of awakening? Do you see everything in new light now? Everything assumed a different meaning now. Ibn al-Qayyim, that's exactly how he describes the state of yaqala. He says, you start to see everything in new light as if you see it for the first time. As if you see it for the first time. That's what yaqala is. And he says, basically, when you are in this state, you will start to look at normal things in your life, but they have new meanings. Again, that's what we said. Everything in this universe tells you something about Allah, but you are unable to see it because you're in a state of ghafla. But when you awaken, everything that happens has a message from Allah to you. So in order for you to see that message, you have to rise up to that level of awakening in order for you to be able to see it. And that's, subhanAllah, this is, yesterday I was speaking with the Messiah and he brought up a point. I never thought about it consciously, so it made so much sense. In Surah Al-Baqarah, in the longest verse in the Quran, which is called Ayah to what? Ayah to Dain, right? The debt. The verse on debt. At the end of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ And have taqwa Taqwa by the way is not only fear It's fear and love and consciousness It's more of an awakening Again, it's a high level of awakening وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Have taqwa of Allah and Allah will teach you And Allah will teach you So that shows that learning comes after you get out of the state of ghafla. The reason we are not learning is not because there's no information around us. The information is all around. But we're not seeing it. We're not seeing it. We're missing out on it. Why? Because in, in, in terms of the level of our awareness, we're not there yet. We're not at the level yet. So we can't learn. Haven't you, for example, you know, Sometimes you, you've done something for all your life, like let's say a line of poetry or some kind, maybe you read a novel or maybe uh, it's a text or maybe a surah from the Quran. You read it all your life, right? But somehow you have an experience and it teaches you something. Then you read this verse and you say, Wallahi, as if I read this verse for the first time in my life, right? But you've been reading it for so many years. Why now you're seeing something different? You move to a higher level. You awaken. You awakened from your ghafla, awakened from this sleep state. When you awaken from the sleep state, you start to see more and you start to hear more. You see more in the things that you already know. Now when you're sleeping and you're dreaming, 
if I put anything in front of you, you're not going to see it. And by the way, don't try it out with someone who's, who's sleeping. You can open someone's eyes when they're sleeping, right? And you can put it right in, put something right, in, this bottle, put it right in front of them. Their eyes are going to, is going to catch it. But they will never be aware of that. They will never be able to see it. Why? Because they're sleeping. They're in a different world. They're in the world of sleep. Again, there are so many signs around us in this world, so many signs, so many beautiful things. We're unable to see. Why? Because we're sleeping. Figuratively, we are sleeping. We're, un we're unable to see them. We're unable to see them. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa says, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا And if you try to enumerate the blessings of Allah, you won't be able. You can't count them. But if you try to count Literally, try to count the blessings of Allah. I'm telling you, you're going to actually reach probably number 20, 30, and you will run out of things to thank Allah for. I'm telling you, try it out. You will reach number 30, most likely most people, you know, stop by there and say, I can't think of anything else. But Allah is saying you can't even count them. And the reason is, we don't know about them. Why? Although we're enjoying them. We are in a state of blindness. Blindness, we are screened from them. Now I'm going to share with you something really profound, really profound. It has to do with ghafla and how much you're missing out on it. And before I mention this, just something popped up in my head. You probably all read a message like this on Facebook or on WhatsApp. Someone will tell you, my dad or my mother died away, uh, passed away last month. And I want to give you a message. I wish, I wish I was good to them when they were alive. So they say, they would usually say, if your father or your mother are alive, you know, be good to them from now, don't wait till they die. Because you will awake to a sad, bitter reality that you have missed out on them. When they were alive, you couldn't see it. When they died, you started to see it. Again, that's a state of awakening. So oftentimes there is potential around us, but we don't see it because we're in a state of ghafla. So the point, the profound point I want to share with you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, He states a rule. He says, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ in Surah Ibrahim. وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ Who can complete? وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ And Allah declares that if you are thankful, I shall increase you. I shall increase you if you are thankful. So if you're thankful to Allah, Allah is going to give you more. If you're thankful, Allah is going to give you more. Now, do you know some of the Muslim scholars, they said, by the way, the more that Allah is going to give you, He's already given it to you. He's already given it to you. But you can't see it and you don't have access to it. You are screened from it. But when you do shukr, you unlock. You unlock. So what do they say? They say usually, when you are thankful, when you have thankfulness, you have to think of what Allah has given you. Because you usually take things for granted. We drink water, you never thought about, you know, being deprived of clean water. You don't know how it feels. So you take it for granted. Water is everywhere. Water is everywhere. Water is everywhere. It, it, you don't know even how... That there is a possibility that you can't find clear water. You, you can't think about it, right? But the thing is, imagine one day you're lost in the desert, you realize how precious water is. You took it for granted. You just drink water even mindlessly. You don't think about it. You don't think to say thank you Allah for this wonderful gift of water. You don't think about that. It doesn't occur to you. But in order to thank, you have to think. In order to thank, you have to think. Basically, you have to feel how water is a wonderful creation, is a wonderful gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when I drink it, it quenches my thirst and it helps keep my body healthy. And when you think about that, then you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in thankfulness. So the scholars say when you, when you, in order to thank Allah, you have to think. And what, does, what this does, it orients your mind towards positive things towards positive things. So we humans have an orientation. If you keep thinking about bad things, 
you'll become very good at finding out mistakes. There are people you can never please. No matter how good you are, they will always find a fault in you. These are masters in, fa in fault finding. They can find a fault in everyone. They can find a fault in every situation. Why? Because they train their mind. They're always grumpy about things. They're always negative. They can catch all the bad things about anything. And they can see hidden bad things because they've trained their mind. But when you do thankfulness, when you are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you train your mind, you change the, the direction of your mind to see what is actually good about people, what is good about the situation. So the scholars say, when you start thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you train your mind to see and detect what is positive and what's good. And when you do that, your mind will start to see all the potential around you that you are blind to. And that's why Allah increases you. Because Allah has already given it to you. But you don't have access to it because you're busy counting, you know, what is, what is going wrong. But you, it never, you never trained your mind to see what is good. So when you start thanking, it reprograms your mind. You start actually having an orientation to pick on what is good. To pick on what is good. And then you will start to see things around you, potential around you, you never saw before. It's this, that, that's, that's how the mind works. So the scholars say, it's not that Allah is going to bring something that He didn't bring before. No. But Allah will open your eyes and open your mind to see things you never saw before when they were around. Again, Allah will awaken you from a state of ghafla into a state of awakening. So, what stands between us and paradise is really a state of ghafla. Is a state of ghafla. And ghafla, as I said, is not only in the mind, it just that's a consequence, that's a symptom, what's in the mind. It is what's in the heart. Now, tomorrow, inshallah, we will talk about the things that could take us from the state of ghafla into a state of yaqadah, an awakening. Into a state of awakening. But I want to mention something about, uh, about ghafla uh, that clarifies a little bit more. Because as I said, ghafla is a very subtle thing. It's not easy. It's elusive. It's not easy to talk about it. Because when you are in ghafla, you don't know it. And you think you're good. You think you're good. You think you're smart. But you, don't, you just don't realize. It's just like when you prank someone, they think they are on top of the situation, right? They, they feel everything's in control. They don't realize until, you know, the prank is over, they realize they were actually fooled. They were in a state of ghafla, again. Uh, the great companion, uh, Hanzala, one day he sees Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And when he sees Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr says to him, how are you today? And he says, nafaqa Hanzala. He says, Hanzala has like fallen in hypocrisy today. So for Abu Bakr, like, what are you talking about? Like, hypocrisy is like the worst thing you could ever talk about. And he says, because when we are with the Prophet wasallam, he tells us about paradise and the hellfire and about Allah. And it is as if we see the hereafter. But when we go back home, we deal with our wives, our kids, our business. We don't feel that anymore. We lose it. So Abu Bakr says, well, I go through the same experience. That's exactly what happens to me. So if it is serious and it's hypocrisy, let's go and check with the Prophet Sallallahu So they go to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam again. So what was happening with Hamdala and Abu Bakr? It's not a st complete state of ghafla, but you know, there are levels. At the highest, there is yaqadha, and the lowest, there is ghafla. Between them, there are levels. You move up and down, up and down, up and down. But you don't want to be low in the state of ghafla. You want to be up. But you can't be on the top all the time. You have to go back. You have to go down a little bit. And then you pick up. Then you go down. Then you pick up. That's what the Prophet ﷺ explained to them. So when they went to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, this is what happens, the Prophet ﷺ says, he says, if you remain upon the same state, لو أنكم تبقون على ما تكونون عندي لصافحتكم الملائكة في الطرقات وعلى فروشكم. The Prophet ﷺ says, if you remain in the same state as when you are with me, the angels would start shaking your hands in the street and in your beds. You would reach a high state of يقظة and awareness and consciousness that you would lose غفلة. 
sort of completely, you become transcendent to the point that you can interact with the angels. You can interact with the angels, you become more spiritual that you can actually interact with the angels on a daily basis. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَلَكِنْ سَاعَةً وَسَاعَةً You know, one hour here, one hour day. Uh, one, hour, one hour there, one hour there. One day here, one day there. So you alternate. Sometimes you're here, sometimes you're there. Because you have to attend to this world. So that's a state of ghafla and awakening. So all of us go through it. But we don't want to be in a state of ghafla all the time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, اخْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مُعْرِضُونَ The account of the people has arrived, is drawing near, and people are still clueless about it, absent-minded about it. Again, so ghafla has little to do with the mind, has more to do with the heart. Has more to do with the heart. So in order uh, to have an early start for tomorrow, inshallah, just to give you a jump start, if you want to get rid of the state of ghafla, you want to get rid of the state of ghafla, it's not about learning. Learning is good. Memorizing is good. But here we're talking specifically about getting out of the state of ghafla. In order to get out of the state of ghafla, more into yaqadha, okay? Don't think about your mind. Think about the heart. You need to think about the heart. Because if you are in a state of ghafla, you see the truth, but you won't understand it. It won't register. It won't make sense. So it starts with the heart. And how does it start with the heart? The most important thing, really the most effective way to get a state of awakening, get out of ghafla, literally, is to feel helpless. Feel helpless. Huh? Really? Okay. <laughs> so, just feel helpless and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just turn to Allah. Say, Oh Allah, I have no power or control over my heart. It's not about my intelligence. It's not about my merit. It's not about my knowledge. It's not about my willpower. I'm just helpless. The hearts are between two of your fingers. As the Prophet said, the hearts are between two fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He flips them as he wishes. Literally feel helpless, say, Oh Allah, I'm helpless. I can't do anything of my own. And I'm just turning to you. Please take care of my heart. Give it a state of yaqala. Give it a state of awakening. And open up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Literally, if you can maintain yourself in this state of surrender to Allah, Helpless, give up on yourself and surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Oh Allah, you do it. I hand it over to you. You take care of that. But stay open. You will see that it will actually start changing your heart. Don't do it just once. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. And keep doing it. You know, sometimes how it happens, as I said, you might just open a mushaf, read a verse, and it just strikes you. And it awakens you. Or it could be you see something in the street and it awakens you. Sometimes you see just one person. Somehow the looks of this person changes you. Or sometimes you just, I don't know, something happens, awakens you. Someone says a word and it opens your heart. It's not the word that opened your heart. That's just the means. It's Allah who opened your heart. So this is just a beginning. Really, that, that, that's the first step in tazkiyah. First step in Tazkiyah and awakening. Again, I just want to conclude because I opened this thing up with Ibn Qayyim. He says spirituality or spiritual growth goes through this, these four building blocks we said, the four steps. This is how you, ha you go through them. At every level you go through the same four. First, a state of yaqadha, you awaken. You move on to a higher level of consciousness and understanding and awareness. Yaqadha. Then he says, Yaqadha leads to tafakkur. It gets you to think. Now, because you, you, see, you see new meanings. So you start thinking about them and analyzing them, trying to understand them. When you do more tafakkur, is ultimately going to lead you into a state of basira.
Basira we usually translate it as insight, but the reality of it is a breakthrough. You have a breakthrough in life. Some things are just going to fall into place and you're going to have a breakthrough in your life. Then the last one is Manzilatul Azm or Al Azima, which basically means firm will. So when you have Yaqaba, awakening, it will get you to start thinking and contemplating and understanding and making sense of things. Then all of this will lead you to a state of breakthrough and clear understanding of Basira. And this will get you into firm will where you actually have the motivation to act and you start acting. He says every step you climb in the ladder of your spiritual growth has to go through, through both four. Uh, most of us skip what? Skip yaqaba. Most of us skip yaqaba. And we want to figure it out in our minds. We want to figure it out in our minds. I mean, you could learn the whole Quran. You could know there is a day of judgment. You could know there is hell and fire and still not pray. And that explains why there are people know, but they don't act. People know, but they don't act. Why? Because they're in a state of ghafla. The learning did not have a base of awakening. Knowledge of itself, by the way, knowledge of itself is not power. They say knowledge is power, right? Not by itself. Knowledge is like uh, fuel. It's like gas. Gas doesn't give you any energy by itself. You know, put gas in a bottle. That's it. Does it do anything in a bottle? Nothing. It's static, right? What do, we need, what do you need to sort of unleash and release the, the energy that is in the, in the gas? What do you need? Spark, right? A spark. A state of yaqada is the spark for the knowledge. If you get the knowledge and you accumulate knowledge, it's like you're having tanks and tanks and tanks of gas and you're not doing anything with it. You're not doing anything with it. If you don't have the fire or the spark, you're not going to use it. It's not going to be. It's not going to benefit you in any shape or form. That's exactly. Knowledge will not benefit you if you are in a state of ghafla. Ghafla means, in another sense, being covered with dust. You're covered with dust, so you don't like. There's there's no connection. There's no connection. So again, this is a state of ghafla, and. The most, I'm just going to conclude, the most dangerous thing about ghafla is basically that when we are in a state of ghafla, we just don't know it. We actually think we are good. That's the problem. That's the problem about ghafla. So usually, you will need the gift of Allah to wake you up. And then when you look back, oh man, I was lost. I didn't know. I couldn't see previously. And Allah sent this kind of awakening through different mediums. Sometimes through a person, sometimes through a verse, sometimes through a lecture, sometimes through an incident, sometimes through a life crisis. Different things that wake us up from the state of ghafla. So the, I think the goal of every Muslim should be to keep themselves in check. Keep themselves in check that they make sure they don't stay in a state of ghafla for long. We're all going to be in a state of ghafla, but don't stay there for long. So this is for today inshallah. This is for today. And again, the concept of ghafla is not easy to describe. It's not easy to describe, but hopefully we got a, a, bit, a little bit of sense of it. How much shaitan plays in ghafla? Uh, a role? Like a role? Of it's, a, it's a big role, absolutely. And she, the way shaitan, and this is probably something we're going to deal with tomorrow as to things to do to get away from the state of ghafla. Uh, one of the things shaitan does to get us in a state of ghafla is distraction. Distraction. Like, again, if you're driving and you're texting, that's a distraction. It puts you in a state of ghafla. Basically, you're, you don't know what's going on, on on the road, right? You don't know what's, what, what's going on with the traffic. So you, you're distracted by this. So it gets you in a state of ghafla. So shaitan absolutely works on ghafla because he knows. With ghafla, no matter what you do, you're stuck. So he's going to keep you in a state of ghafla. Mainly by distractions. He has other strategies. He strikes fear in the heart. 
uh, he creates doubts in the heart, all of that keeps a person in a state of ghafla. But mainly distraction, and that's what his waswas is. Shaitan keeps throwing ideas at us, ideas at us, for distraction, for distraction. So we don't pay attention to what really matters. So Shaitan plays a major role, absolutely, yes. What, what I said about this verse is that when Allah says, if you are thankful, I shall increase you. Now, this is a rule. If you are thankful, Allah will increase you. Okay, so we all agree on this. Now, the scholars use now their reasoning to try to figure out what is the mechanism. So, one mechanism is yes, if you are thankful, Allah is just going to increase you, give you more. Which is, makes sense. But some scholars said one way this could happen, okay, there are many, Allah works in many ways. We can't really, you know, get hold of all the ways, but we can reason with some of them and figure out some of them. So, one of them is actually, <clears throat> and they found this with people who do gratitude. By the way, this is, uh, I mean, this is social sciences. Uh, the practice of gratitude has been around for about a decade. It became very popular. They say, you know, pick three things that you are grateful for, right? Write them down. It's a, it's a very good practice, by the way. So they figured out when people start practicing uh, gratitude, they, they name three things every day, unique, three unique things, and they feel grateful for them. So they just contemplate how good these things are in my life and I feel grateful for them. So you have to get into that state of gratitude. They say usually these people, they, their temperament as a human being changes. They become more positive. They start to see the good things. And one aspect of this, they start to see opportunities they never saw before. So it's just one way of explaining the verse, but it doesn't limit the verse. Okay? So Allah works in many different ways. We can't limit Allah by our understanding. So yes, it could be Allah increases, He creates more and gives more. And it could be a, that Allah has already, that's another way is what could be, Allah has already given that more, but you can't reach it. The reason is you're blinded from it in your heedlessness and your ghafla, because you're so focused and distracted by the negative. So when you train yourself to focus on the positive, all of a sudden you start to see more. And, and this is actually very common. I remember uh, investors, by the way, Investors, because of their training, because they train their mind to see opportunity, they see opportunity for investments where most people can't see. Where we see problems, investors see opportunities. It's, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's an orientation of the mind. It's an orientation of the mind. I don't want to make it more philosophical because reality is, again, self-made to a great extent. We make our reality in a sense. It's a common... Um, I think there is a very good example about Ghafla. Uh, when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, majority of the Prophet do not believe that Prophet has passed away. And even Umar ibn al-Khattab said, who said, Muhammad passed away, I kill him. And until Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu alayhi wa sallam re recite the ayah which he said, Wama Muhammadun illa rasulun. Everybody wake up. Subhanallah. And Umar ibn Khattab said, I, I read this ayah many times, but I didn't, I didn't realize this, that this is the meaning. Subhanallah. Until it read in this typical situation. Subhanallah. Jazakallah khair. Very good example, really. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, everyone was in a state of disbelief. Even Umar al-Khattab <coughs> couldn't believe. But when Abu Bakr anhu recited the verse that Muhammad is just a messenger like previous messengers, and if he dies, are you guys going to turn back on your heels? Umar al-Khattab says, وَكَأَنِّي أَسْمَعُهَا لِأَوَّلِ مَرَّةً As if I've never heard it before. Although he knows the verse, but it's just a completely new meaning. That's a moment of awakening. Jazakallah khair. The question is, if you feel you are more in a state of ghafla, you're losing it a bit more. So how can you get out of that state? One of the best things that I would say, one of the best ways, especially if you feel really stuck, really stuck, Sahbatu Salihin. Find people who are good, righteous, who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they inspire you, they awaken you. People used to believe in the Prophet just upon seeing him. Just upon seeing him. You know, when uh, Amr ibn al-As became Muslim, uh, and he became Muslim later on, uh, the Prophet ﷺ sends him as a leader of the army. He's just a new Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ sends him as a leader of the army. 
uh, and I think it was called Ghazwa to that al-Riqa' Was it Ghazwa to that al-Riqa' Probably, yeah uh, And who's in the army as a soldier? Abu Bakr and Umar Who's leading them? Amr ibn al-As just became Muslim These people were Muslim like more than 15 years ago And this man just came, became Muslim last night and he's leading them but he knows about warfare. So the Prophet makes him the army. They go march to the north of the Arabian Peninsula. On the way, they don't know the locality. So they hire someone who knows the, the, the routes and the, and, the, and the hidden ways. And who is he? He's a thief. He's a thief, very well-known thief. And by the way, he was extremely intelligent. He developed a technique that made him escape chasers when people chased him they couldn't catch up with him and this was he would get ostrich eggs he would cut them in half empty them fill them with water and plant them at different parts different areas in the desert and when he would steal run away people would chase him he would run into the desert and he would have pockets of water to drink and people would run out of water so he would be able to go deep in the desert without people catching up with him just based on this technique so the Muslims took him as they hired him as a, uh, as, a as a guide to show them the locality and to uh, to guide to take them from hidden routes so he spent with them a couple of days he sees Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr like when they sleep Abu Bakr uh, shares his blanket with him and he shares his food with him and he looks at Abu he's completely taken by Abu Bakr then he says to the Muslims he says I want to be like this man I just want to be like this. he's taken completely by the beauty of the character of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu so, and then he becomes a very good Muslim just by this time he spends with Abu Bakr so usually what awakens people is and this is what in Arabic by the way you know the Bedouins have a subhanallah uh, nomads and Bedouins have some wisdom they say nafas rijal yihyi rijal nafas rijal yihyi rijal they say the breath of men awakens men it brings men to life right timing okay <laughs> really uh, so sometimes a person's breath really awakens you sometimes you just see someone you deal with someone you speak with someone they change your life they take you to a completely different level. So what I would say, and if you really feel stuck, you need good company. You need good company. Yeah. And this is not only with religious things, even with any, any area, any aspect. You, you go around with investors, you become an investor. Automatically, you don't, feel, you don't even know how. You just become an investor. Okay. Uh, again, Jazakumullah khair for your attendance and your patience. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.